Good afternoon on today's Angry Bulletin. NASA is preparing to send a fleet of spacecraft out to the moon. Indeed, the process has already started. And even though one of these spacecraft did not get anywhere near the moon, unfortunately, another did make a successful landing, albeit with a couple of footnotes attached to that landing, but still managed to accomplish the majority of the mission. And there are Many, many more spacecraft coming soon, manufactured by a wide variety of different companies. However, the NASA Office of Inspector General has discovered that not only has NASA's plan fallen behind schedule and gone over budget, but also NASA has deviated from its original plan, and this seems to be creating more problems than it's solving. All of this and more coming at you on The Angry Astronaut right now. Good afternoon and welcome to another Angry Bulletin. Once again, I need to thank some awesome people who have helped make my recent journeys possible. Thank you so much. And if you'd like to join these folks, all the details are in the description. Gennaro Gaza, AJ Commercial, Kevin Pratt, Louis Basto, James Denson, Martial Roman Uloa, I think I'm probably mispronouncing a lot of these, I'm sorry, Russell Nishida, Lucas Idzik, Philip Noble, Chris Hill, Eric James, David Bradley, L.W. Beck, Dan Hawksworth Artworks, Randall Silva, and Lambda Commodities, and there are still many more. I will do my best to get to all of you. Thank you so much for your support, and thanks to everybody else for your patience as I recognize all these awesome folks. So what you're watching right now is a NASA rundown of their CLPS program, which a lot of you are probably familiar with, but a lot of you may not be familiar with just how ambitious this whole thing is. Like many things associated with Artemis, NASA has contracted private companies, a lot of private companies, through the CLPS initiative with the objective of exploring the moon's surface in advance of eventual human presence on the moon to gather as much scientific information as we can prior to humans being risked on these Artemis 3 and Artemis 4 missions and the missions to come. However, like so many things associated with Artemis, this program too has run into quite a number of challenges. First and foremost, as most of us probably know, the astrobotic mission did not do very well. Control was lost over the vehicle almost immediately after Vulcan Centaur put it on its initial trajectory. And even though a Herculean effort was made to save the spacecraft, ultimately NASA compelled Astrobotic to put it into the atmosphere where it burned up, having gathered very little information. Then after that, as most of us probably remember, Intuitive Machines had a much more successful mission to the moon setting down on the lunar surface in spite of losing its range-finding LIDAR, something that was absolutely essential to a soft landing, and yet Intuitive Machines and NASA found a very innovative workaround utilizing an experimental LIDAR set that just happened to be on the spacecraft at the time in order to attempt a landing, although this LIDAR was not designed to be used in conjunction with this spacecraft. Consequently, the spacecraft was still moving laterally at the same time that it was very close to the lunar surface because, once again, intuitive machines could not be certain as to where the spacecraft exactly was in relation to the lunar surface, and it tripped over a rock breaking its landing legs in the process and essentially landed on its side or kind of halfway on its side because it was propped against a convenient rock which allowed the transmitters on the spacecraft to make contact with ground stations on Earth and transmit as much information as possible before the spacecraft finally went dark. We don't seem to have retrieved much in the way of photographs or any other really high 
high density data information from this particular mission, but the majority of the objectives were apparently accomplished in spite of the problems. Granted, these missions have not gone nearly as well as China's recent missions to the moon, but we're still making progress, as the NASA OIG report states. But at the same time, there have been numerous problems. So let me go ahead and explain what upcoming missions are coming with the CLPS program and what the NASA report had to say about them. Now, next up, presumably, is the second Nova C mission from Intuitive Machines, and hopefully this one goes better. And then the first Blue Ghost mission from Firefly. Blue Ghost, by the way, will be launched on a Falcon 9, but is another commercial lunar lander, this time built by the Firefly Corporation and a company that really was focusing on small sat launches at first, but now it started to diversify, which is a very good strategy in order to maintain some longevity in this industry. And then after that, we'll have the third Nova C mission from Intuitive Machines. And in addition to that, at some point during these missions, there will also be the Griffin 1 from Astro Robotic. That perhaps is going to be the most critical mission of all the CLPS missions in the near future because it's going to be carrying the Viper Lunar Rover, which is designed to look for ice in Shackleton Crater. It's incredibly important that this mission goes well. And then after that, Draper will be landing a mission in 2025. It's Series 2 Lander. And then after that, the second Blue Ghost mission from Firefly. So quite a number of spacecraft are scheduled to be headed to the moon inside of the next year and a half. But here's where we find some of the problems, at least according to the NASA OIG. Quote, Despite progress made towards CLPS objectives, numerous challenges have resulted in total initiative cost increases of $208.2 million and an average scheduled delay of 14 months per task order. Specifically, five of eight task orders have experienced both scheduled delays and price increases since the initiative began in 2000. 2018. Our review found that NASA deviated from its original hands-off strategy for the initiative and from its plan for incremental progress towards larger missions. Rather, the agency's aggressive development schedules led to increasingly risk-averse practices and policies. For example, NASA insight and oversight increased and more detailed vendor proposals were required. This resulted in higher costs and delayed delivery schedules while threatening the initiative's ability to achieve its broad objectives. Specifically, inserting a larger lander to accommodate the Viper rover into CLPS's early schedule interfered with a progressive development approach. This introduced the added risk of beginning the first large lander delivery before knowledge could be gained from the success or failure of smaller deliveries. NASA's planned hands-off approach was also somewhat negated when the agency added augmented insight and placed added requirements on the vendor's development process. We found that NASA's directed changes, including augmented insight and landing site changes, led to $171.4 million in project cost increases. NASA officials also set aggressive lunar lander delivery schedules, averaging 30 months from contract award to launch, based on overly optimistic market research studies. This optimistic scheduling did not provide a sufficient margin for unforeseen events, such as vendors' supply constraints or technological development challenges. Consequently, Seven of the eight task orders have experienced scheduled delays as of February 2024, and the average time to launch has been 44 months. NASA chose firm fixed price contracts for CLPS, even though the initiative's operational conditions were not suitable for the optimal use of these contracts. And I actually agree, even though I'm a fan of fixed price contracts, there are so many things that we really don't understand about the challenges 
challenges of landing on the moon with these little spacecraft that the price points may have been very difficult to deliver on. Optimal conditions include well-defined requirements, a stable market, low financial and technical risks, and experienced contractors. In fact, vendor issues arising from inexperience, financial risk, and lunar delivery being in a new economic sector contributed to cost increases and scheduled delays. Several vendors face technical difficulties in developing their landers. Financial pressures affecting these small, relatively new companies contributed to one CLPS vendor bankruptcy and continuing market uncertainty for the others. Vendors also struggled to obtain launch vehicles, which led to additional delays. And of course, yeah, that was an obvious problem because Vulcan Centaur was so significantly delayed. That was a problem, obviously, for Astrobotic, even though it appears that Peregrine would have fa failed no matter when it launched. And then finally, the COVID-19 pandemic affected schedule deadlines and vendors' ability to procure vital parts and materials. Our analysis showed these challenges will continue to hinder NASA's ability to meet the initiative's objectives. While the initiative has a contract capped at $2.6 billion through 2020, Eight. That's not a lot of money really for all those years between 2018 when the project started to 2028. 10 years, $2.6 billion, and quite a number of lunar landings. Doesn't really sound all that realistic. Anyway, the report goes on to say that increased costs on previous task orders jeopardize the plan to issue two task orders per year. Future missions with increased complexity would put further strain on the CLPS budget. Yet, frequent task orders are required to keep the vendors engaged and invested in the lunar delivery economy. We surveyed CLPS vendors, and their responses discussed vendor challenges, including an uncertain commercial market and competition within the vendor pool to win NASA task orders. In the five years since CLPS began, NASA has not reassessed market conditions to better understand the agency's role in changing market conditions. And finally, we found CLPS lacks a detailed management plan that could outline a disciplined approach, promote accountability for how the agency measures success, and help the initiative weigh competing priorities. Whew! Sounds like a lot of issues. So here's what the NASA OIG recommends. That's what I like about these guys. They don't just talk about problems. They talk about solutions. To increase accountability and transparency for CLPS, we recommend that the associate administrator conduct updated market research on the commercial lunar economy and reassess NASA's role in the commercial lunar delivery market. We also recommend that the Deputy Associate Administrator finalize a management plan for the CLPS initiative with clear performance goals and metrics, a formal lessons learned process, and other relevant guidelines. We also recommend that the DAA for Exploration coordinate with other directorates to prepare and formalize a CLPS manifest selection board charter process and strengthen procedures to ensure payload interfaces and requirements are mature enough to minimize changes late in the development process. And then finally, they recommend that the DAA for exploration, in coordination with the CLPS and Viper project managers, assess implications of the first Peregrine lander failure on the Viper mission and impacts to the CLPS initiative's cost and schedule. This last step that they recommend, that's probably the best recommendation of all, because even though Astrobotic had a serious failure on their first mission, I have a great deal of confidence that they'll be able to carry out the Griffin mission successfully and it's vitally important that they do so because the Viper rover on board the Griffin is absolutely essential to the Artemis missions overall. This is what's going to find lunar ice inside of Shackleton Crater. If we don't know where that ice is, 
it's going to be impossible for NASA to determine where their lunar base at the South Pole should be. And without that information, a lot of our human landings at the lunar South Pole are going to be flying blind until we actually track that ice down. And the Viper is designed to do that over a sustained period, over weeks and months, looking for that ice with instruments specifically designed to do it, whereas astronauts are are going to be hindered by their life support requirements and the distance that they can travel from their landing sites and they may not even land at the proper location. So yes, these are absolutely vital changes that need to be made to the CLPS program because people really don't understand just how vital this program is to the future success of Artemis. When it comes right down to it, it doesn't really matter when and Lunar Starship is ready. If our robot scouts have not delivered enough information prior to Artemis 3, that mission will be little more than planting another flag on the moon, and we really have no need to do that all over again. Thank you very much for watching. Please like, please subscribe, also please check the description for various ways to support this content, and as always, stay angry about space.